in the meantime, I'll also just give a brief introduction uh, to Village Preservation, to anybody who doesn't know us, and I'm sure we have some new folks here, although I see a lot of very familiar faces. Uh, Village Preservation was founded in 1980, and we are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to document, celebrate, and protect the special architectural, cultural, uh, and co architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. We do that through education, advocacy, and programming. We're a membership-based organization, so if you like the work that we do, we encourage you to join or support us, although uh, much of our work, including our programs like this, are open to free to the public. Um, uh, but that's with a lot of member support. So thank you to all of our members who make that possible. Um, we're just gonna check on a, one or two other quick details and then we will get started. Given that we have six candidates, we're gonna give folks 90 seconds for most things unless you hear uh, otherwise. Um, that should give us enough time to get through the program for the evening. So why don't we get started? Um, and I'm just going to first ask each candidate in 90 seconds or less to uh, introduce themselves to the public and opening uh, statements are going to be in alphabetical order, closing statements in reverse alphabetical order, and the questions are going to be in, in random order to uh, candidates. So uh, uh, I'm going to start with uh, Eric Botcher. Thanks. And Eric, I'll give you a 15 second warning when you're close. Okay. Great. Thanks. Hi everyone, thanks so much Andrew for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Eric Botcher and I'm running for city council as someone who has uh, dedicated most of my adult life to public service and activism, most recently as chief of staff to our current council member, Corey Johnson. And some of my proudest accomplishments of my life have been the work that I've done on historic preservation with Andrew and Simeon Bankoff and others to win a South Village Historic District LGBT historic sites, the land, the um, Stonewall Inn, Tin Pan Alley, but also in my personal capacity and my own life as an activist, I've been on the board and the board of governors for the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative for the last seven years, fighting for a new historic district on the historic Lower East Side, organizing walking tours. I've organized lectures. Uh, four years ago, Andrew and I actually co-moderated a candidate forum for District 2. So by electing me to the city council, we'll be electing a preservationist to the city council. And that's more important now than ever because we owe it to future generations to preserve our history, our historic architectural and cultural sites for future ex generations to experience. So I really look forward to tonight's forum and to discussing this issue that is very, very personal and important to me. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, next up we have, and uh, correct my pronunciation if it's not right, uh, uh, Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Phelan, yeah. Phelan. I know, I don't look like a Phelan. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this uh, event tonight. Um, I know for anyone watching, uh, they may not know me. Um, it's hard to put your, your trust in someone that you don't know, but I, I think there's so many of us who don't feel right now that they have a voice and who think that their worries aren't taken into consideration. And I think as a city council person, you know, it's our responsibility to include um, members like you into conversations about the well-being of our city home. Um, I've been a small business operator in, in District 3 for the past 16 years. I'm a gay single dad to a, a really smart four-year-old named Artemis. And I'm a gun violence survivor, having lost my father to a hate crime in 2001. I believe in public service, and I believe that all New Yorkers, you know, generally, no matter what our backgrounds are or what our professions are, we can use our experience and apply our sense of service um, and commitment to the community and run to really represent the, the needs of working people in this city. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm happy to, to be here to answer all your questions and I'm looking forward to this uh, forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up is Marnie Halassa. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Marnie Halassa. I'm a lawyer, community activist and figure skating coach. Uh, I am outside the establishment uh, and I believe we need to return power back to the community. I've been a tenant activist uh, fighting against FRAD for public housing tenants in the district for the past couple of years. And we were successful in stopping the demolition of two Fulton Houses buildings. 
but privatization has been uh, quite difficult because those in power refuse to listen to the tenants, like white colonialists telling black and brown people what to do, those in the District 3 community, the mayor, the NYCHA working group, Community Board 4 have no, no problem espousing racist housing policies that evict and displace people of color. But people are not taking it anymore. I see a grassroots revolution brewing of regular New Yorkers, neighborhood groups, academics, workers, joining together in solidarity with a unified voice to say no to all these land grabs and the corrupt alliances enabled by the mayor to council members to the city planning commission. If elected, I would enact community driven development, reintroduce the Small Business Job Survival Act, place a moratorium on rezonings. I would also repeal mandatory inclusionary housing, stop intro 2186. People are paying attention now because the future of our neighborhoods and historic city are being given away. And that will be seconds. reflected at the ballot box June 22nd. They are saying no, and I join them to protect the city that I love. Thanks very much. Uh, next up, and again, uh, correct my pronunciation if it's not right, uh, Alita Lafargue. Got it. Great. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Alita Lafarge, and I'm so pleased to be with you here this evening. Unlike any of the other candidates here tonight, I was born and raised in this district, and I'm now raising my son here as well. It's brought me so much joy sharing with my son so many of the historic locations throughout the city and especially the West Village. Just last year, his class did a Virginia Lee Burton study and he got such a thrill over uh, being able to visit the Burton House at 17 Grove Street, one of the most historic examples of New York City preservation. I also look forward to bringing him to see a Christmas Carol read at the Merchant House Museum once he's old enough to sit still. I've lived my whole life and spent the last five years as the elected tenant president uh, of the Manhattan Plaza Tenants Association. And I've enjoyed the benefit and safety of affordable subsidized housing my whole life. And I know how very dear the need for affordable housing is to our city right now more than ever. But as a woman of color, I have watched local politicians use arguments that manipulate our communities into believing that the only way we can provide this important resource is by giving developers carte blanche to demolish our most beloved sites and replace them with sky sucking high rises, proposing as little as 300 to 500 units while studies show that these proposals threaten more units of housing than they would actually create, disproportionately displacing Ten people. Seconds. I believe that we can preserve our beautiful historic landmarks and match the beauty and scale of our wonderful communities while providing affordable housing for those in need and making these areas less affordable or displacing longtime residents and particularly people of color. And it will be my priority to make sure that affordable housing is done ethically and equitably throughout our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. Uh, next up, we have Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself uh, to introduce myself. I've been a resident of this district for 17 years and I've been living in the same pre-war apartment. Uh, now I'm here with my husband, our eight-year-old daughter, Cecilia, and our dog, Bailey. I am a third generation New Yorker and the very proud granddaughter of immigrants. Uh, all four of my grandparents fled Armenian genocide and ended up here in New York City, not knowing a stitch of English. And growing up, my parents owned a small cheese store and I remember my mom waking up uh, way before dawn to head to the store and then my dad coming home way after dark. So I know the sweat equity that goes into a small brick and mortar business. I am running because I love my community. I love the groups. I love the history and the intangibles that make all these small gathering of buildings really our neighborhood. Um, all of my community service has been as a volunteer. I'm an executive member on our community board. I serve on the Hudson River Park Trust Task Force for greener open spaces. And I worked at the local women and children's shelter. Uh, before that, I was an investigative reporter for 20 years and I did not imagine I would ever seek public office. But when COVID came along, I saw really the collective failure of government at every level to take care of all these people who make up my neighborhood, the small business owners, the educators, the NYCHA residents, the elderly. 15 seconds. I this tragedy exposed the cracks that have already existed in the system and whether uh, we've had years of leadership really, who regardless of whether they said the right things in public, in private, I believe lack the political will to do the hard work to fix it. So I'm running to change that. Our community is resilient and I wanna turn ideas into action. I look forward to your questions, thank you. Thanks very much. And then we have Arthur Schwartz. 
I'm a candidate whose perspective has been shaped by living for 40 years in the Greenwich Village Historic District, first at 99 Bank Street, then at the puzzling corner of West 11th and West 4th, in an 1832 townhouse, to now in an 1842 townhouse on West 12th Street. I am a fighter, as villagers watching today know quite well. I've been an activist since 1968, a public interest and civil rights lawyer since 1978. I cut my teeth in local politics fighting to repair and expand local parks and playgrounds all over the village in Soho. I was a member of Community Board 2 for 24 years and its parks and waterfront chair for 18 of those years. I helped create Hudson River Park and brought the lawsuit which got feels on Pier 40. I'm a fierce defender of my neighbors and my neighborhood, of its character and of its livability. And I, I consider myself to be a disciple of both James ja Jane Jacobs and James Baldwin, who I believe in solutions that come from below and that are just. And I want to take that perspective to the New York City Council. And I wanted to say one last thing is that I've known Andrew since 1995 and I told him today that if he was running, I would step aside in a minute. And it's an honor to be questioned by you. 15 seconds. Thank you uh, very much candidates for your opening statements. So the first question, uh, that I'm going to ask is tell everybody why you are a good candidate for people who care about preservation and don't want to see history destroyed or out of scale or out of character development in their neighborhood. And I'm going to start with Alita, Alita Lafarge. This mute thing is going to get tricky. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So I am a big history buff. I always have been. I get a lot of joy from uh, studying history. And as I mentioned just before in my opening, um, some of what brings me so much joy about living in the city are is is sharing with my son the historic um, landmarks that the city has to offer. I think that. Um, what makes a city unique and special and um, encourages people to come here are, you know, is the landscape. And um, I think it's a, really a sin to destroy these beautiful um, spaces because there are other ways to get the result that we're looking for. So um, I would certainly never put uh, a historic uh, landmark on the chopping block when I know for a fact that there are better solutions for us. We just need to be creative and have the political will to find them. Thank you. Arthur Schwartz. You know, as I said, I've lived in the historic district for 40 years and I have been involved in both learning as, a, as an owner of a, you know, what was an inexpensive townhouse what it meant to live in a historic district, how valuable it was for me and the kids I raised here to live in a, in a community that had uh, air, light, breathability. And it's part of my heart and it's part of my soul. And my neighbors are part of my heart and my soul. And people know that the perspective that I take on all questions always starts from what's good for my neighbors and what's fair. And I, I'm gonna say, you know, when I, I referred to Jane Jacobs in the beginning, I often look I read, this is a very dog-eared copy of, of Death and Life of Great American Cities because very often when I try to determine what perspective to take, besides figuring out what Andrew is gonna say, I read Jane Jacobs and I try to understand what she would have done in this situation because she is the person that started the movement to help create our community and that which is as valuable as it is today. And I'm not a BS artist who says I'm for preservation. I fight for preservation, I fight for uh, for um, uh, affordable housing in the same context. I fight for tenants. I fight for building owners. I fight for the people that live around me. And because of a record, it's not just, not just what I say, but a record of doing that that I think would make me the best candidate for preservationists. Okay, uh, Eric Botcher. Well, the reason that I consider myself the preservationist candidate in this race is because of my record in historic preservation. I've testified in front of the LPC more times than I can count against bad applications and in favor of good applications. 
I spoke at the rally against the demolition of 14th, 16th, 5th Avenue. I helped push through the landmarking of the Stonewall Inn. I worked on the effort to successfully beat back 775A, a bill that would have instituted artificial time limits that would have shortened, uh, put time limits on the amount of time that uh, a landmarks application could be in front of the LPC, which would have been something that developers just would have used to run out the clock. I worked on the effort to beat back the rules changes at the LPC that would have watered down the landmarks uh, process that uh, would have really been detrimental that we successfully beat back I was in meetings with the LPC, LPC chair. I helped lead meetings with the LPC chair to push back those uh, rules. I met with the LPC chair in my personal capacity on many occasions about the seconds. Lower East Side Historic District that we're fighting for other, uh, other uh, properties that we worked to successfully prevent the demolition of and to preserve. It's central to my public service, this issue. And it's gonna be very important in the next city council to have gonna, people who know the LPC process. And okay, that's- Eric, we're, we're just gonna move on to the next uh, uh, candidate, Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Yes, um, I have been consistent with this throughout this whole campaign. The two words I've been saying, character matters. Character really does matter. Uh, it matters in neighborhoods. Uh, preservation, I believe is crucial to keep up the character and individuality of our neighborhoods. Uh, I don't think the value of this can be understated. I think we have to protect historic uh, di districts. Uh, I also believe it actually brings a balance to neighborhoods. So we have these big shiny towers going up what seems like to me here everywhere and anywhere. And to get one small little piece of history protected is this long laborious process. So I think we have to shift the balance of power. Um, I do believe in a no one size fits all. Um, so another, another reason I think I am the best candidate for this is political will. Uh, Alita mentioned this, political will. It's really who is gonna fight for it? Who, is, who has that political will to do the work and to do the background? Um, listen, Rebney has, a, has long opposed landmark sightings. They say it ruins property values and strangles the economy. I believe opposite. I actually believe that landmarks and preservation stabilizes neighborhoods. I think I think it helps residents. I think it helps small businesses. And again, I think it's a uh, it brings community and character. And I'll, a little anecdote. Ten seconds. If you are coming from New Jersey, Massachusetts, anywhere, and you're visiting New York, do you think they're going to visit the high shiny towers? Maybe Empire State Building. Yes. Okay. Or, or One Trade Center. But they're going to the charming little neighborhoods, they're going to the village, they're going to Soho, that's the character and that's what brings people to New York City. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, next is Marnie Halasa. Oh, there you go. Sorry about okay, that. here, okay. So I believe that I'm the best candidate because I actually have stopped the demolition of two NYCHA buildings at Fulton Houses. So I've actually done that work and actually how we did it is we did like, uh, we had like a huge sort of like media campaign. We put that we collectively organized the tenants. We had weekly meetings with the tenants. Uh, we put them in front of the media. And honestly, you know, we did a huge sign that said, we're not moving. And uh, I think that was instrumental. And actually the tenants were basically saying to the media that, they would chain themselves to their radiators because they were not going to move. And honestly, I think for a lot of these fights going on in New York City, people have to like actually go to that place and actually say, we're not going to take it and we're going to chain ourselves. And, you know, that when the bulldozers come, there should be people lined up to save like the East River Park or to save NYCHA buildings, to save like, you know, Soho historic buildings. Uh, because I think actually, if we did that, we would save our city. Uh, that's one thing. Also, if elected, I would introduce inter uh, legislation that there should be no demolition of existing structures. Two French, 
two French architects are actually talking about that, that they repurpose existing structures, they do not demolish. And this is a new perspective that I think needs to be introduced in the conversation. There has to be a compelling public safety need in order to demolish. And I'm helping to organize a protest to save the Pennsylvania I'm Hotel up. on Wednesday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, and Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, for me as a candidate, it's it's a little simpler. And I, th I think that even when we aren't really fully conscious of it, you know, our neighborhoods, our buildings, our city home, um, there's a lot of solace that can come from these things um, and places that provide stability and continuity, um, especially now more than ever. You know, when at times we feel that our lives are really appended and everything that we thought was secure in our lives suddenly isn't. Um, in the current ongoing health crisis, you know, our scenic landmarks have really particularly, um, I have appreciated them a lot more, uh, sort of around the same solace and refuge um, as they did around the time when 9-11, you know, so, you know, when we're worried about the everyday struggle of our own lives, you know, I think we sometimes forget how important our city's rich history is in its buildings, um, and also in the fights that have been fought inside the walls of these important buildings and the contributions um, that have been made that most of us are really just completely unaware of but have contributed greatly to our lives and sometimes even our freedoms and our democracy. And I think it's also really important to remember that economic distress like our city is going through now can result in the loss of some of our most important historic buildings because for-profit real estate development loves nothing more than fiscally tumultuous times. Um, those are opportunities for them for overdevelopment and the eradicate, eradication of, um, of old to substitute for new and shiny. So that's why this is important to me. Thank you. So the next question I have is, I wanna ask the candidates their thoughts about the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Do you think they do a good job? Do you think they do a bad job? Are there things that you would point to about them that you would change or improve? And how would you as a city council member affect that change? Would you use your role as uh, a member of the body which must approve all appointments to the Landmarks Preservation Commission to try to affect how that body works? Um, and the first respondent for this question will be Marnie Halasa. Okay. Europe. Okay, so um, you know, I, I to be honest, I don't know that much about the Landmark Pre uh, Preservation Commission, uh, but I would say that I do know something about other commissions going on in the city, and what I see is that those commissions are always stacked. Uh, the Economic Development Corporation. I mean, a lot of these commissions always have like Rebney people. Uh, and they're always rigged. I mean, everything is always rigged. So uh, what I would do with that commission is, um, you know, the council member, uh, it shouldn't be just like the mayor always. I mean, there has to be, you know, regular people that are on that commission and it can't be stacked, like the debt can't be stacked against, uh, against um, you, know, uh, you know, being able to uh, uh, preserve our buildings. I mean, it has to be like regular people on, on the commission and not people from uh, the EDC or, or Rebney. Thank you. Next. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, if you weren't finished, please, please come. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question again? Uh, well, I was just asking everybody what they think of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the job that they do and how as a city council member, they would try to affect uh, the work that they do. Okay, that, that's enough, okay. <laughs> next is uh, next is Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Uh, yes, well, I think now that uh, Sarah Carroll is in, I think it's a little better than it, than it was before. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm big across the board uh, with community input. So I, I think that especially with landmarks and preservation, nothing can substitute for community input when they know the intimacies of their own neighborhood. Um, and I agree with that in the upzoning as well. I mean, I, I think that uh, I, I'm very much into community input and for the specifics of a city council person to know their neighborhood, right? I don't believe in a one size fits all. I don't believe in a general city planning um, where something that's good for one neighborhood is good for another. So I think with landmarks, this is where organizations like yours are really pivotal 
because they know these issues. They know the streets intimately, sometimes even more than the city council person. Probably, you probably, you guys know more about every little landmark building than any of us probably here on this call. And I think that's why that's important that the community input, whether it's from the community board or it's from organizations like yours is, is super important. Um, like I said, the character matters in a neighborhood and who knows that better than the people in the neighborhood themselves. Thank, thank you. Uh, next, we have Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Thanks, well, I guess the, the question is really at the core is, you know, what does it mean when a, a building is given landmark status and what does that mean? Well, it means that your building has special historical, cultural or aesthetic value. It adds that to the city of the New York. Um, and I think it's a really important part of the city's heritage. Um, you know, that the, LP, the LPC, you know, usually tends to approve advance um, and alterations, reconstruction, demolition, or new construction affecting the designated building. But I think what happens is, is, is sometimes the LPC doesn't really appreciate the historic nature of some of the buildings. And I think sometimes it really just gets entangled with uh, for-profit real estate development. And I think that's when a city council person really needs to rely on the people in you know, the community and uh, the community board. Um, when it comes to um, what gets built, what gets torn down, and what is considered historic value to our city. Thank you. Uh, next up, Alita Lafargue. Thank you. So, you know, my father is 78 years old. He's originally from New Orleans, and I spent most of my summers as a kid going down there with my family. And um, that's a place where they have maintained the historic nature of their city. And it is the reason why people go there and it is what makes it so special. And I think that's just part of, um, you know, my blood and, and I and a, grew an appreciation for um, the, the history in that. I, I also, as a little kid, my mother, um, who's an actress, she uh, protested the demolition of the Morosco Theater. She was one of the Morosco 200. I actually was caught on film, on, in, on, in the news, being ripped from her arms as she was arrested for this protest. Unfortunately, um, that theater was demolished. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how well, um, that this commission has worked. But I also agree that there is no one size fits all for each community. I think also this is something that we can um, think about when it comes to the outdoor dining um, piece that you know we've all in, uh, enjoyed. My father's also a restaurant owner. Um, he also lives in Chinatown in a little three flight walk up that's uh, you know rent controlled. He hasn't had his rent raised in eight years. And at 78 years old, that's a really important thing. But I think that when we think about um, how each neighborhood would benefit or lose, it's really important to come, as the others have said, to groups like yours, to block associations I'm and um, ask the people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric Botcher. So I have a pretty good working relationship with the new LPC chair, uh, Sarah Carroll. She, I guess she's not new. I guess it's been like three years already, but. It is an improvement over uh, previous uh, chairs. And, you know, I worked with her when she was the executive director of the LPC. The city council member is gonna be very important to ensuring that the LPC uh, retains integrity and is strong, not only because of the individual land use actions, weighing in on individual land use actions, uh, but also being sure to push back against any legislative attempts to water down the power and oversight of the LPC. And thirdly, the city council conducts oversight over agencies. And at the LPC, we have to ensure that appointments to the LPC are that preservationists are being appointed to the commission. And that also commissioners do not have conflicts of interest, something that hasn't gotten enough attention people who have um, or are employed by the industry, which in some cases that could be an issue. So we really have to conduct seconds. strong oversight. That's what I'll do, push back against attempts to water down the LPC and weigh in heavily in favor of preservation on individual actions. Thank you. And Arthur Schwartz. Uh, I think it, 
you know, I've, I've watched a number of LPCs over the years, and I think that a lot of it depends on the mayor and the perspective that the mayor wants to bring to it. I know that the LPC chair that was appointed by uh, Mayor de Blasio, uh, Srin Bastin, in, in 2014, uh, changed the whole concept of what historic preservation meant. Um, under his guidance, the LPC, which still has a lot of the same members, uh, allowed major alterations to landmark structures. They allowed additions, they allowed extensions you could see from the street. Uh, they were applying a less rigorous standard. Um, they allowed bigger buildings, larger buildings, um, and, and, and really took away a lot from from historic districts. There's a new chair, but I'm scared about the vote they took this week uh, down on the Lower East Side near the Brooklyn Bridge for that site where they basically agreed to allow a skyscraper to be built in, in a historic district because they said the only alternative was a parking lot. To me, uh, for my neighborhood as a city council member, I would insist on extensive vetting of everybody appointed to the LPC to make sure that they actually were preservationists. 15 and seconds. And they didn't have fealty to the, to the developer community, uh, but to the neighborhoods that they're supposed to be serving. All right, thanks very much, candidate. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna ask you about the issue of uh, preservation and affordability. Uh, we've increasingly seen in the city, um, some would seek to pit preservation as being in opposition to affordability and have said that the solution to our city's very real affordability challenges is to peel back either landmark regulations or zoning restrictions to allow larger and larger development. Sometimes saying that they would be, uh, they would include affordable housing. How would you uh, balance preservation with affordability and do you believe that the two are in fact in conflict or are there ways of preserving the built environment of our neighborhood while also addressing issues of affordability? And the first respondent for this question will be Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Thanks, you know, I think that um, New Yorkers are owed something better than this idea um, of this false choice between affordability issues or preservation issues um, and rezoning and uh, for-profit, mass for-profit uh, re redevelopment. Um, look, I mean, racial impacts of land use decisions are incredibly important. You know, most communities throughout New York have seen major land use actions that have exac exacerbated um, rather than work to alleviate displacement pressures um, or, you know, affordability issues often most times in low income communities of color. Um, racial justice and land use is really long overdue. Um, and this past year has been an extremely challenging time for New Yorkers. It's really led for demands for racial justice to guide systematic changes um, and the city budget. You know, the multitude of, of structures that really have historically reinforced systematic racism. Affordability is one of those issues. Um, and while New York City really, really relies heavily on the New York state government to fund and support critical infrastructure like our public housing, um, the, the city government does not, or the city government controls uh, land use and zoning decisions. And since the city council controls- 15 seconds. This deeply important process, it's really crucial that we center racial justice um, in all future decisions on land use, um, okay. preservation aside. Thank you. Uh, next, Arthur Schwartz. You know, one, of, one of the central premises I always listed as my first issue in our district is the lack of affordability. Um, I, it's astounding to me that that um, my I've raised four kids in this district, two of them are teenagers. None of them could afford to live anywhere in the third council district. Um, they could not live anywhere near the third council district. Even affordable apartments require a minimum income of $70,000 a year and my lawyer daughter doesn't make $70,000 a year. So, uh, and we live in a district which has, under Corey Johnson, has had the most luxury development of any city council district in the city. So to me, the pr it's, it's almost a foregone conclusion as you guys showed in your study of the Soho NoHo uh, zoning proposal that, of, that affordability 
and, pre and preservation go hand in hand and not the opposite. I mean, you guys developed amazing statistics that everybody should study about not, it's not just about affordability, but also racial makeup of the community that in fact, it's likely that the less affordable uh, post preservation, pr post preserved communities are also gonna be whiter. And I don't know how you can get much whiter than Greenwich Village is now. I know in the last census, community board, two, community board two had, had 94% white people, 4% Asian, 2% black and Hispanic. That is an abomination. Uh, next up is uh, Alita Lafargue. You know, I've lived in um, subsidized housing my whole life in Manhattan Plaza. And this is an incredible model that we have here that I really have never understood why it hasn't been replicated around the city because um, the model for affordable housing right now, there's nothing affordable for it. Maybe it's affordable for millionaires, but um, these sliding scale rent model is section eight housing, even the Metrolama program. I, I, I'm clueless as to why this isn't replicated. Um, mixed income models, which really provide a, a, a wrong communities, which in turn help support um, living conditions. So, you know, you're not, uh, building uh, very, very low income, very, very high income. We're blending. We're living amongst each other. Next door to me, I have a Tony Award winning composer and directly across the hall from him, I have a, uh, a neighbor who's lived there for uh, 25 years and he came directly from a halfway house because he suffered from mental illness. And we all live very beautifully together. And um, this is a model that I think that needs to be replicated and does not require us to uh, sacrifice our historic districts. I think that that's a complete manipulation of reality. I think that we've built high rises all over Hell's Kitchen, where I live, that are sitting empty. The people uh, who rent these apartments don't even live here. I mean, we need a pied de terre tax. We need mansion tax. We need to find a way uh, to make things more equitable. Thanks very much. Uh, next is Eric Botcher. Well, I totally reject the false choice between preservation and affordability. I think that that uh, pitting those things against each other, it shuts down conversations when what we need to be doing is working together. And when there's an opportunity for affordable housing in a historic district or anything involving a historic landmark, bring in the preservationists, bring the community to the table affordable housing folks sit down and let's talk about community-based planning. Let's come up with a way that we can create the affordable housing while also maintaining the integrity of the historic district because all that landmark protection really does is require uh, approval by the LPC. If it complies with the uh, text of the landmark designation, it really shouldn't be a problem so I, I reject that dichotomy. Thank you. Uh, and next is Marnie Halasa. Okay. Uh, yes, I also agree that it is a false choice. Um, it's not in conflict. I mean, right now, because of the pandemic, there's empty buildings all over the place, empty hotels. Uh, so there really is no shortage of housing. What we need to do is repurpose those empty buildings. For deeply affordable housing, we also need to preserve rent stabilization and fully fund NYCHA. Um, but to me, the rezonings uh, are very, very problematic. Uh, MIH is a failed housing doctrine. It's a doctrine of gentrification. Uh, what's interesting now is that there's a lot of gaslighting going on. It's now being couched as a social justice issue. Uh, you know, when in fact MIH displaces low income uh, people of color, as well as white people who don't have a lot of money. Uh, and this is what's going on in the Soho rezoning. Um, so uh, I, also, I, I also believe that we need more community driven development like the Chinatown Working Groups plan. Uh, and also we need to change the city charter. And if I'm elected, that's something that I would do. I think we need to uh, change it so uh, it's not so you know top down decision making. So it's more community based. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a hard fight, but that's something that um, that I would 15 do. Fifteen seconds. Thank you. 
uh, and Leslie Bogosian Murphy. So I believe all neighborhoods should share in the responsibility of providing affordable housing. Um, but housing in a neighborhood, whatever the designated affordable income bands are, should adapt to the neighborhood, not the other way around. Uh, when we look at upzoning, as you mentioned in Manhattan, we have to first take a step back and see who is pushing that through. So that's an automatic red flag for me. Aligned real estate, they have some obvious interests here and it's not affordable housing. So I think we know the motivation and um, it, it, the motivation is massive disproportionate amounts of market rate units. So the bottom line is we have to stop undervaluing our assets and giving away to developers. Like I said before, and I do believe it, character of a neighborhood matters and preserving that character matters because once we change the character of a neighborhood, especially the historic character, that's gone forever. So instead, as you ask, let's take a serious look at new conversions of commercial buildings to residential use. Adaptive reuse, I am a big fan of. Um, that should be considered first. And same scale development should be considered. Our district, uh, it, more in the northern part of the district, Andrew, is going through, we're gonna be starting three new affordable housing uh, and additional builds which is wonderful, three, three affordable housing builds. All of them are same scale builds. So there is always seconds. more than one way. And um, I do wanna to touch upon, you mentioned something that really is an unsettling pattern. When a community speaks up with concerns or identifies problems, uh, the city, and in this case, certain developers, they obfuscate the argument and the Time's resident up. voice concern are automatically targeted against affordable housing. And yes, that's wrong. All right, thank you. So. Uh, uh, we're going to pivot here to a question which some of you have actually already anticipated, which is the Soho NoHo rezoning proposal that the city has put forward. Now, it uh, is just mere inches outside the bounds of the third council district, but it certainly has implications for uh, the third council district, um, especially as the mayor and others have said that this is a model that they would like to see replicated um, throughout the city. So I would like you to um, share with us your view or opinion of the Soho NoHo rezoning plan and be as specific as possible in terms of what about it you support, what about it you oppose, either everything or nothing. Um, and uh, what sort of changes you would implement in neighborhoods like Soho and NoHo or other similar historic uh, more well-off than average neighborhoods as ways to make them more equitable, but hopefully without destroying the scale and character of the neighborhood. So uh, first up for this one is gonna be Arthur Schwartz. Thank you, it took me a second to unmute. Uh, as you know, I was at the rally today um, uh, and I testified at the public hearing. I was actually the first speaker at the scoping hearing um, against the, the plan. Um, I think that any plan that includes mandatory inclusionary housing uh, to build affordable housing, much less racially uh, diverse housing is a, is a total waste of time. I don't think the private sector should be allowed to develop affordable housing. I don't think that they have any interest in affordable housing. I don't think mandatory inclusionary housing is a concept uh, that, that should continue under any new administration. Uh, I would reject any MIH um, projects in my community, and that's why I reject them in, in, in Soho, NoHo, which, by the way, we do have three blocks, Andrew. I think to the west of Thompson Street and 6th Avenue, we have three blocks of it. I, I looked on the map. Um, and uh, uh, so what I don't what I don't like is is upzoning. I don't like uh, making buildings higher. I don't like the, the 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 ability of developers to determine the future of a fifteen seconds like that. Uh, and I think that the proposal that 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 your group has put forward, uh, which is a much more uh, uh, moderated within existing boundaries uh, development within Soho, is the right way to go. Next up, we have Eric Botcher. Oh, I'm really disappointed by what's happened down there uh, from what I hear because I believe in community-based planning and that is not what has happened down here. Community-based planning with all stakeholders coming together and coming up with a plan that is a win-win, a plan that makes sense for the community. And I know that Community Board 2 is not 
unreasonable. Community board two is a board that can sit with the city and come up with a plan that generates affordable housing and maintains the integrity of historic districts. The city isn't working in good faith with community board two from what I understand. From what I understand, they had like a year of meetings, community meetings about what to do and then came back with a plan that was very different than what was discussed. Um, and we've worked with Community Board 2 and, and the city and come up with some great projects and, and done that with Community Board 4. Again, the city needs to come to the table with the, um, with the community board, with community members, and you know maybe there are some lots where it does make some, seconds. some like one story lots where there's a building that's not contributing that could be a really great place for affordable housing. But uh, what I'm seeing is not community-based planning. And uh, I find it very problematic. And there's a real vacuum of leadership involved. Thanks. Uh, next, we have uh, Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. I don't think there is any question that is that provided more contentious uh, arguments in my campaign than this one. Um, as a black candidate, I have to tell you, someone who grew up really poor, um, when someone provides an opportunity and says, hey, look, there's an opportunity for some affordable housing, your first instinct is to wanna jump on it, um, any affordable housing whatsoever. But um, ultimately, no, um, no to Soho, no rezoning. I, I, I think that there's no doubt that affordable housing and housing security is probably one of the biggest issues city council members are gonna to have to address. You know, sometimes with stringent regulation, you know, there can be benefits associated with upzoning, namely um, the depreciation of housing costs and the, the redesign and reorganization of existing physical spaces. But historically, uh, you know, upzoning has increased the power of real estate developers and landowners really to the detriment of working class New Yorkers, um, really, and the public. Um, and New Yorkers- 15 seconds. Uh, given appropriate regulation, private investment in land use can be beneficial. However, you know, most of the investment should be in the public domain. You're never gonna get uh, affordable housing built um, by you know, real estate developers just saying, well, we're gonna do this out of the, the goodness of our own hearts. That's really never gonna happen. You're gonna need a city council person who's gonna be able to to work both ways. Thanks. Next is Leslie Percy and Murphy. So if you didn't guess from my last answer, I guess you uh, you probably know that I am not a big fan of upzoning and I am against the Soho No Ho plan. Um, and I think I mentioned a lot of the reasoning before, but I will go further into it. I'm also not a fan of uh, MIH. So I think the city really only triggers it when the development and the units get to a certain level. And for me, which is somewhat of an irony, isn't it? Uh, you have to have so many market rate level uh, units before uh, the affordable housing triggers. So I find these deals, like I said, grossly undervalue the city's position. We have to stop giving away precious land and assets to developers with 80, 20 or 70, 30 deals. Uh, and in these contracts, by the way, there are loopholes um, that guess what? Favor the developers, uh, such as Soho Noho, like not hitting a financial threshold. So, um, Yes, I am not for this uh, Soho No Ho deal. And if, if I can make, uh, I guess, of what we, what we should do. So I think to make truly affordable housing, we need to lower AMI bands and we got to, and also we need balanced AMI bands. Um, we have to make sure that these contracts have to be guaranteed. There are no loopholes. Let's tie up those loopholes. Um, I also believe there should be, um, as of right builds, uh, absolutely. And, um, and like I said, adaptive reuse. And I want to sneak in in a little environment here because uh, environment is a big part of my platform that these big buildings, NYC buildings contribute to almost 70% of the city's carbon emissions, 70%. So right. gotta... let's think about that too. Thank you. Um, and next is Marnie Halasa. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, like Eric brought up lots, like you could build like affordable housing. So, I mean, I think everybody here remembers what happened with Elizabeth Street Garden, how like that, that whole, you know, garden was raised, 70% of it was raised, you know, for, uh, you know, for affordable housing, but, you know, there was a lot 
um, you know, nearby where uh, the, the affordable housing could have been built, five times more affordable housing could have been built. So the problem is that like Corey Johnson didn't vote for it, Margaret Chin didn't vote for it, and Carlina Rivera, like the council members don't vote for it. So there's a lot, you know, relief is re within reach, but then the council members, like they, they, don't, they don't vote for it. So, you know, that to me, that's like super problematic. Um, also, you know, I'm just thinking about the future, but you know, Corey Johnson's like master rezoning plan. I mean, everybody here, every candidate here should be completely against it because it gives the mayor final say and it doesn't give any community any input. Uh, and so, you know, I there should be member deference because the council member is closest to the constituents, but- 15 seconds. But Corey Johnson's master, you know, that plan should be like thrown in the garbage. And like I said before, rezonings are problematic for me. MIH is a failed doctrine. Uh, but also if I'm elected, I believe that the community needs final say in land use decisions. Uh, if I'm elected, I would hold hearings I'm to- up. Find out. Here. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Alita Falarg, Lafarg, sorry. That's okay. Um, you know, like all the other candidates, uh, I definitely believe in community led conversations, but I think in the past we've had our council people listen to our communities and unfortunately not, uh, you know, follow through on what the community has asked for. And that's been a big problem in uh, our neighborhood. There was a lot on, you know, in the 50s, which actually it's, there's still been no movement there, but um, our community board and our block associations fought for many years to make this a, um, a middle income uh, affordable housing. And uh, after all of these negotiations, um, it was just decided that it would not be that, it would be something different. And so that's going against the will of the community. So. Uh, you know, I would not be a council person who would waste the time of my community by listening and then not actually acting on, on what it was that their will um, had offered. And I think that, you know, it's been proven in other cities that these upzoning um, projects have actually resulted in that loss of affordability and have disproportionately displaced people of color. I mean, we have proof of this. So the notion, again, that developers out of the kindness of their heart are going to provide affordable units is kind of insane. Um, I, you know, we have buildings around us that are blocking the sun from our playgrounds that, again, are sitting with empty apartments inside them. I think that a lot of state coming up with taxes for the rich, we can provide better affordable options. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, we are gonna switch gears for this next question. Uh, I wanna ask all the candidates about outdoor dining, which is certainly a, a hot topic. Um, and the question I wanna ask you is, as we move hopefully out of the pandemic, what do you think is the appropriate role and place for outdoor dining uh, in our neighborhoods? Does it belong? Does it not belong? Where and how would you decide? Um, and the first respondent is going to be Marnie Halasa. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I think during the pandemic, uh, when the restaurants moved to outdoor dining, I think they had to do it because, you know, they needed to survive. So, I was for that. Like during COVID, I was for that, but I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be permanent. And also I think communities actually like that, you know, they, they want the ability to have some kind of say and actually the final say. So um, to me, the fact that the community didn't have any input, um, meaningful input was, was problematic. Um, you know, listen, I talked to, I talked to a lot of my friends, a lot of people do, do like it because it gives it more of a, gives New York the city a more of a, you know, sort of like a European feel, you know, but I know there are, you know, um, they take up space. Um, um, those huts are not done consistently. Uh, you know, uh, the disabled have like mobility issues because they're taking up so much space. So, you know, I think there actually needs to be, you know, some kind of like uniformity, uh, you know, of those structures. But uh, but again, it goes back to the community. The community, I really feel needs final say in, in that. Thank you. Uh, next up is, whoops. Next up is uh, Alita Lafargue again. 
Yeah, again, community, community, community input. Uh, I said before, my father owns a restaurant um, down in the village, employees only. And actually, he was and his partners were not excited about uh, having the outdoor space because it just wasn't part of the way that they had ever um, done business before. But because of uh, the obvious, the pandemic, it was the only way that they could survive. And so they did set up some outdoor dining, which I know they eventually will take down of their own accord. Um, also, yes, the uh, accessibility is a major issue. I'm a person who lives with a disability. It makes it difficult for me to walk. And, you know, I have several friends who are using scooters and not to mention mothers with uh, strollers are really struggling now. And the uh, notion that they'll have to go out into the street, contend with bike lanes, et cetera. I mean, there are so many things going on in our streets right now, especially down in that area um, where the streets are smaller. Um, yes, they do provide uh, an element of, you know, this, like Marty said, this European outdoor fresco eating model is lovely. And I think that in the areas where it has been um, enjoyed and welcomed, we should consider letting it remain. And I seconds. think it needs to be one oversight committee that um, decides with the community again, you know. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Thanks, really good question. Um, you know, the good part is it was, a, you know, outdoor dining was originally conceived to help suffering restaurants and small business owners, you know, during the pandemic. Um, and it's really been the saving grace for most. Uh, it's really added to our city's economic turnaround. You know, the post pandemic New York, I think we really need to be flexible and adapt to new norms that, you know, have amassed in our communities. Outdoor seating for restaurants is just one of them. You know, these restaurants have really bore the brunt of, of financing um, outdoor structures to be able to accommodate uh, the, the city, at one point constantly changing uh, dining regulations. And I think it'd be unwise and unfair to make uh, such a legislative decision without really creating some type of survey like system for all restaurants in the area. You know, many customers prefer to be outside and with uh, restrictions gradually changing, you know, I think we need to move with the times, but also be respecting of the areas in which the restaurants are located. Um, I think the community can work together um, internally to solve these issues and best address their needs. Um, and there needs to be common ground between the business owners and the locals. That's really where the solution lies. At the same time, recognizing the, the wishes um, of the local community, um, more thoughtfully integrated sites um, within exactly. the environment. Um, and a single agency, yes, uh, to oversee the structure and enforcement um, efforts to secure safety for customers um, and pedestrians walking on the street. Thank you. Uh, next up is Eric Botcher. I don't think anyone argues that uh, outdoor dining was a bad idea during the pandemic. Arguably, it saved tens of thousands of restaurants from going out of business. And as we consider the future of the program, we need to consider that there are some spots that make a lot of sense and people like it, the community likes it. There are some spots that really don't make sense. And when you look at a historic district, it's even more complicated. The signage at uh, Bon Bonnier on 8th Avenue is totally covered by a tin awning of some kind, that iconic sign. That's got to go. White Horse Tavern has disappeared behind a bamboo thing with flowers on it, that's gotta go. But then there's a lot of spots that are more um, in a gray area. You know, does it stay, does it go? And there needs to be a process, a community-based process for deciding that. And that's what is missing now. What stays, what goes. I don't believe in a one size fits all approach for the whole city. The Village, Chelsea, House Kitchen, Corona, Staten Island, they're all different and they all have different needs and they all have different uh, 15 layouts. Seconds. So we need to have a process where we can figure this out for the future to have something that makes sense for each neighborhood and each block. Thank you. Um, uh, next, we're gonna hear from Leslie Bogosian murphy uh, Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so our restaurants, along with our arts community, uh, were the hardest hit due to uh, um, COVID-19, and I think it was very necessary, very necessary, excuse me, for outdoor dining, absolutely. But for making them permanent, 
I think we have to go through a much more lengthy process and definitely with heavy community participation. So I think, yes, it's helping owners bridge the financial gap um, and I, for the foreseeable future. But we have to think long-term and what the consequences are long-term. This is public space, right? This is not, this is not private space. These are, this is public space. So for the city to give away public land for free to me is, 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 is very disturbing. Uh, and I think it's problematic with, uh, without a serious com uh, conversation. Um, and yes, this is now helping restaurants, but long-term it actually will hurt restaurants. Why? Because now, and we're already seeing it, commercial uh, developers and commercial landlords are saying to these, these restaurants that are already hurting, you know what, we have an outdoor space. We're raising your rent because we have this outdoor space we can charge. So now what was supposed to help restaurants are now actually in the long-term going to hurt them because their rents will be raised on land that is not even owned by a commercial uh, uh, landlord. So I think we have to come to some sort of um, understanding with, like exactly. I said, heavy community participation, um, where this is going. And also now I know up here in the Northern part of the district, it's blocking a lot of the designated bus lanes and I'm a big public transit person and we have to rethink that uh, discussion as well. Time's up, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, Arthur Schwartz. You, got, you have to unmute uh, yourself, Arthur. I had done it, it was remuted. Uh, a after after uh, the city council uh, with the cheerleader being Corey Johnson uh, enacted this bill that said we shall have permanent public dining with no no criteria at all uh, last fall. Uh, I was part of a group that created New Yorkers to save our streets, and to me, it's not it's a cheap it's whitewashed on what a long term solution is for small businesses, restaurants, and others. We need commercial rent control in New York. Uh, these restaurants need their rent to their landlords, which right now the back rent runs into the hundreds of thousands for given. Um, to me, it's also a real estate giveaway. I think what Leslie said is spot on. The, 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 this, these sidewalk sheds and these off the curb sheds that have been created are giving away the, the uh, space to the people that own the property that are renting it to the restaurant. So when the restaurant goes out of business, they now have a place that they're not paying taxes on that's maintained by the by the government for them to rent to uh, other restaurants. We have accessibility problems. We have accessibility not just on the sidewalks, but accessoride can't reach. Fire department can't reach. There's noise problems, especially in the village. There are safety problems with all these. Fifteen seconds. Problems. And landmarks, landmarks. It, it it's it's made a farce of the whole concept of the landmarks commission in the village, and yet. And yet the city council under Corey Johnson said, let's make it permanent. Uh, there needs Time's to be up. far more regulation. Okay. Thank you, candidates. Um, continuing in this vein on uh, small businesses, but uh, moving away specifically from outdoor dining, I'd like to ask each of you to name three things that you would do to help small businesses in our neighborhoods and our city. Uh, and I'm going to start with Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Passing the SBJSA, passing the SBJSA, passing the SBJSA. Look, I'm a small business operator, uh, the only candidate who uh, is a small business operator here in District 3. Um, I had a store in Chelsea called Beach Bum Tanning. I have three locations. I now have two. Um, you know, when the mandatory closures happened, um, we were closed for three and a half months. Well, the landlord is charging $250,000 for back rent that was owed for our, our closures. Um, the SBJSA would have helped me. I could have kept my store open. Um, and that was really devastating for me. I had uh, 12 employees who worked for me for over 10 years, you know, lost their jobs. I couldn't fit everyone into the two remaining locations that I had. Um, and look, I think that there's, there's a reason why it wasn't passed. It's, it's, it's been up to be passed multiple times. Um, Corey Johnson has in, been in the hands of for-profit real estate developers for many years. Uh, everyone knows that. It's no big secret. Um, and I think that for-profit real estate development really has a hold over this district specifically. Um, small business operators need help. Um, they need help uh, negotiating their rents. And they need help negotiating rents with predatory landlords uh, like myself. 
And one of the big reasons I jumped into this race in the first place was because I did need that help when I was reaching out to the city council for help and I wasn't getting it um, because, the exactly. city council, because the city council person who was also speaker was running for mayor and he cared more about securing himself a job um, while the rest of us were losing ours. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Yeah, so um, our, even before COVID, our small businesses were hurting, right? You would see them shuttering down and, and it wasn't the big pharmacies or the supermarkets or the banks, it was the small mom and pop shops. So, that, and that's because, well, one of the big reasons was because of the Amazon effect, right? They, they saw that some people are seeing something's quicker and cheaper. So the mom and pop stores couldn't keep up, right? So I actually have started to help already. And I haven't been elected yet. So what I did was I brought there is a e-commerce platform called Shop in NYC, and it started in Brooklyn. And when I found out about it, what it is is it takes all the mom and pop stores in the neighborhood in Brooklyn at the time, and it puts them all on one platform. So it's ease of service, it's next day delivery, um, and they pay their delivery drivers living wages. So when I met with them, the owners, uh, by the way, a female business owner. Uh, I asked her, I go, how can we get this to my district? Because our mom and pop stores are hurting and we need something, not just an infusion of cash, which yes, of course is necessary, necessary during COVID, but we need to think bigger. We need to think long-term. We need to change the way people think about e-commerce. So we negotiated and now I'm very happy to say that our district is the first district outside of Brooklyn, Hell's Kitchen, Chelsea, West Village, that has seconds. this platform. It helps our small businesses. It's helping our residents. Um, so if you want something in the village, Andrew, if you want something in Hell's Kitchen, you order it, it'll come to you tomorrow, just like Amazon, and you're supporting small businesses in the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, next will be Arthur Schwartz. You gotta unmute Arthur. The, uh... I agree with Phelan that the first thing that has to that has to be passed immediately, even before we're in the city council, uh, is the Small Job Survival Act. The second is we need commercial rent control in the city. Uh, when when the S when the SJB the, when the Small Job Survival Act was first proposed, the real estate interest said, "Oh, this is just a form of commercial rent control." It isn't. It's a, a method to negotiate fair rents. I think we need to freeze rents. Um, and at this point, in order to res to restore sanity to our our, our local business scenes, um, finally, I think that um, uh, there's this big problem with the back rent that a lot of store owners have because one of the reasons people are going out of business, even though business is they can now go back in, is they may owe a quarter, like Phelan said, a hundred a quarter million dollars a year uh, to their landlord, and that's being held over their heads. Um, the state has a program to try to pay some of this back rent, but to the extent it isn't sufficient, then the city, I would propose that the city give landlords a real estate tax break in return for their, for giving the rent to the small businesses so that the state basically can foot the bill to get small businesses back on their feet. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Alita Lafarge. So I agree, we need the Small Business uh, Survival Act. We, um, we need reliable transportation again to increase foot traffic. We need to expedite permit approvals to get small businesses and new businesses up and running. I definitely support uh, rent control on commercial uh, real estate. I think that we need to create a, a commercial rent guidelines board that puts up limits on uh, rent increases from year to year. I mean, I think we've seen that landlords have also um, gotten away with murder. I mean, when it comes to um, vacant uh, storefronts, n no landlord should be benefiting off a vacant storefront, um, driving up the, the real estate prices. Um, so I, I think that there needs to be more equity um, in our city. And I think that that comes from our lawmakers. I think that uh, there's a lot of creative solutions, um, including, you know, some of these big box stores that, you know, have been like banks, they've been giving these outrageous tax breaks from the federal government. Um, can we work with them to 
adopt a small business, a small mom and pop shop. I mean, there are creative solutions. I don't think anybody is considering. And, um, and th again, the landscape of our city depends on our mom and pop shops. And without them, you know, totally. thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from Marnie Halasa. Okay. Um, I also um, uh, support the Small Business Job Survival Act. Um, you know, in 2017, when I ran against Corey Johnson, uh, that was the issue that I really, really pushed. Uh, City Hall insiders said that, like my, my tiny campaign, actually pressured him to give it to give it a public hearing in 2018. He pro he promised that he was going to tweak it and then pass it. He never did. Um, and you know, that's a huge problem. I mean, you know, it just seems like, I mean, I was a small business owner. We had a coffee shop, Red Eye Coffee on 34th and 9th Avenue a couple years ago. We had a predatory landlord, but I mean, if the council, if the speaker, I mean, Corey took his name off the bill when he became speaker, but if the speaker is not going to bring this bill, I mean, we're honestly, <clears throat> there's, there's no recourse. Uh, so that's a huge problem. So you know, people really have to do their research, like who is really in favor? People can say that they're in favor of this legislation and that, but if they're really not, you have to do your due diligence to really see like if they're, if, if candidates are really, really honest about it. Um, you know, I also believe in canceling the rent for small businesses. They need some kind of rent relief. I agree with Arthur about like, putting it in the city budget. Um, you know, um, also, I think a really good idea is, is to remake the small business services, because honestly, they do nothing. In 2015, they got something like $10 billion. They helped less than 300 businesses. So we got to remake them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, last is last up is Eric Botcher. So three things that haven't been mentioned yet. Zoning that limits the amount of chain stores in a particular neighborhood and specifically these banks that are appearing on every corner the banks rent out a corner spot they know that the bank isn't needed you never see anyone in there it's advertising for the bank it tears down a whole neighborhood so we need to really uh pilot this and and get this going it's something that's been proposed uh, community board three i used to be a public member of community board three has been working on this for many years uh, minimum rent terms. When a property owner takes out a mortgage, they frequently tell the bank how much they're going to get for a storefront. And they will often tell the bank a very high number, a record-breaking number. They are locked in, in many instances, they're locked in to that. So we need to really take a look at that. Um, it's something that doesn't get talked about much. Finally, vacancy fee, vacancy fee, vacancy fee. If you are a property owner who is leaving your storefront open and holding out for a chain and holding out for a record uh, rent for years and years, 15 seconds, you've got to get a, you've got to get a fee for that. We have to disincentivize that. And I want to couple that with a program that puts pop-up artist spaces in empty storefronts. Let's, let's work with nonprofits like Shashama, get the city involved, and encourage property owners and incentivize them. Time's up. Put, uh, Thank you, Eric. In your spot. All right, so here's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna move uh, quickly into uh, questions from the public, which we've been getting lots of them. I've uh, been sorting through them and the ones that we've uh, gotten the most on. Here's how it's gonna work. You're only gonna get 60 seconds and you have to raise your hand. You don't have to respond to every question. If you raise your hand, uh, candidates, I will call on you. Um, but if you don't want to respond to that question, you don't have to because we have limited time. So the first question that I've heard from a few people about is the issue of member deference in the city council. Do you believe that member deference in the city council is a is a good thing that you would continue, a bad thing that you would oppose, or or what? If you want to respond, raise your hand. Okay, I'll start with Eric. In general, I do believe in deferring to a member who's closest to the issue, who's worked with his or her community, but I don't, I would reserve the right to break with that. I don't think it could be a hard and fast rule 100% of the time. So in general, I support the concept, but I would always reserve the right 
to do what I think is right. Okay, great. Uh, Leslie, I see you also had your hand up. Uh, Eric, I agree 100% with you. <laughs> that's uh, absolutely. I do believe in member reference because I think that's what makes communities communities. I mean, every community is different. No one size fits all. And uh, I don't think anyone knows their community better than the people who live there. And then in turn, the, uh, the representative. Okay. Anyone else? Arthur? You know, I'm going to say community board, community board, community board. Uh, I, I, after 24 years on a community board, I think that where the community board differs with the, with the city council um, member, which I saw happen here in community board too many times, uh, uh, that the members should not be pay, paid deference to. Okay. Um, other candidates? Okay, I see both, uh, I see two more. So let's start with uh, Phelan. Phelan. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, I, the role of a city council person is to be a representative, a representative of the entire community. And, you know, with reference to what Arthur is saying, you know, community boards are really important. Um, however, I have seen in the community boards, specifically in District 3, that a large majority of those are made up of white men who work in for-profit real estate. And I'm not sure that any of us can say that really that is um, the forefront in equity and decision making, especially when it comes to land use uh, or preservation. Okay, um, looks like every candidate's raised their hand. So uh, I'm gonna go to Marnie next. <laughs> like I said before, um, you know, Corey Johnson's plan, 2186, throw it in the garbage. Uh, you know, it seems like all these mechanisms, you know, uh, so many of these mechanisms, it, it leaves it to the final say of the mayor, which is really, really problematic, or the final say of the speaker. Again, really, really problematic for communities. If I'm elected, uh, I would, have, the I would uh, have hearings to determine how the community could have final say, like what would that actually look like? So that's important. And also I agree with Phelan about the community boards. Even Gail Brewer has something on her website that talks about that, all the community boards, like they all, uh, they're all like co-op owners and the majority of New Yorkers were renters. So that's a problem. Uh, you know, like um, yeah, things have to really change. I mean, I just feel like <clears throat> the whole system <clears throat> is so problematic. So I just wanna, uh, you know, um, basically tell people that you, you, you guys really gotta fi figure like who is a candidate that Time's is up. really the Thank agent you. of change. Thank you. And Alita, uh, Alita Lafarg. Yeah, Phelan really nailed it on the head. I mean, just this uh, past couple of months, you know, I, I the community board district, uh, the community board Ford reached out to me directly um, because they're looking to diversify because they know <laughs> that they're uh, not representative of a diverse population, and they know that I, as a woman of color. M, and that I know who, uh, you know, I, I know the people in this community. Um, I know the, the people that aren't just white and they know that uh, those people speak to me and are my friends and are my neighbors. And that of anyone they could come to, they came to me to look for that diversity. Um, and I've been trying seconds. to help them to diversify. So uh, yeah, I think that it is important to listen to the person that the people elect. And, you know, for the most part, yes, I would, I would say, uh, let's go with the, the, with the city council person elected in that district. But, you know, we do have to consider, um, again, equity. Thank you. Um, and just to briefly explain to all of our audience what member deference is, it's the common practice within the city council whereby the, all of the members of the city council defer to the local member when there's a land use issue in their area and vote with them on it. So moving on to one other area that we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience about, and again, I'll just ask everybody to raise your hand if you do wanna respond, no more than 60 seconds. We've hit on this before, but mandatory inclusionary housing. What is your view of it? And there are two elements here that I, I think we're particularly interested in hearing your feedback on. 
Uh, the mayor has made mandatory inclusionary housing dependent upon upzonings. He will only require that new housing contain affordable units within it if there's a big upzoning. In other words, a very big bonus is given to a developer. Otherwise, he won't require it. And then there's the issue of requiring affordable housing and new development. How much, how deep, how affordable. So it's a big topic, but in 60 seconds or less, tell us your thoughts about all those aspects of it. Um, and uh, all right, I see Eric's hand up first, but I see a lot of others going up as well. So Eric, you go first. I support requiring affordable housing and new development. Okay, uh, then let's go to Phelan. Um, so there are some there are some good things, uh, you know, from rezoning. Um, one of those uh, is the 421 G program, um, and that's a series of tax breaks for commercial to res residential conversions um, that was launched in the '90s to revitalize Lower Manhattan. And a similarly conceived plan could transform Midtown Manhattan. It could work well to solve a lot of housing issues. Um, and this isn't the first time you know, this has happened in New York. In the last decade, I think a record 96,000 plus units nationwide have been created by transforming schools and factories and offices. Um, but yes, I, uh, as, a, as, a, as a Black person, I think you know, um, we need affordable housing. Um, but there's always going to be a fight against how much. And that's always going to be... Uh, a big fight against you know, for-profit real estate developers and making the decision on when it's really affordable housing or when it's you know, uh, a separate like entrance uh, for you know, poor black and brown people, um, separate laundry services, separate uh, daycares. Um, these are all things that we're gonna have to take in consideration when we're talking about um, development. Okay, uh, I see uh, Alita Lafarge has her uh, hand up. Yeah, again, I think that um, these proposals are not um, really the, the, the way that we find um, equitable, uh, affordable housing in our city. I mean, the idea is not entirely uh, rotten to the core, but it's just not been good in practice. And, and there's proof of that. I think that um, current proposals are going to make our community less diverse. I think there are other more creative ways to find affordable housing that don't, don't include, you know, blocking out the sun over our communities. Um, and then I see Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Yes, I think I already said this. I, I'm not a fan of MIH, but um, th there's other ways to do it. Uh, like I said, we, we do have affordable housing going up in our district. Um, and what it is, is it was from Hudson Yards. And what they're doing now is doing same scale in other areas. We found lots. And so there is another way. We found empty lots. And now we're doing inclusionary housing on those lots, which are same scale. Um, and another thing is that I think we should push harder on these contracts with these big builds. I've been saying this, that we got to get them to commit to new schools or to renovate schools. If they have a certain number of units, then they have to provide for whatever the community is that they are now putting up build a new school. And if there's no room for a new school, then you're, then you're renovating the existing schools. And I feel very strongly about that. Right, okay. Um, all right, we're gonna hit the final two candidates, Marnie, Halasa, and then it'll be Arthur. Okay, uh, like I said before, rezonings are very problematic. Um, and, and I said before, MIH is a failed housing doctrine. It's a doctrine of gentrification. Uh, the fact that they they make a minuscule amount of affordable housing is really just it really actually really outrages me. Um, if I was elected, I would repeal it like on day one. I would try to repeal it. Human scale. Um, the group human scale had a statistic that said that out of 80,000 promised affordable housing units, only 2000 were built in the past four years. So I thought that was very telling. Again, I feel like we should repurpose empty buildings for 100% affordable housing and actually solve the homelessness crisis because we actually could do it now. Also, the issue of secondary education. Uh, the, I always mention the Half King, the bar, a bar I loved on 23rd Street and 10th Avenue. They had to move, um, you know, because of uh, gentrification. So, uh, you know, that MIH is about to go. Thank you. Uh, and Arthur Schwartz. You, uh, you have to unmute, Arthur. There you go. 
I'm going to say it again, the private sector will not build affordable housing. The mayor knew what he was talking about when he said, I'll give you upzoning in return for you doing MIH. So the private sector is not going to do affordable housing. There must be a capital plan. Maya Wiley and I agree on this. There must be a $10 billion or more capital plan. There's a lot of money available to borrow to build affordable housing schools, medical clinics in this city. That's the way to do it. And to the extent that there is a commitment on the city to have mandatory inclusionary housing in developments that are already underway once we bar it, based on the bill I will introduce on day one of the city council, we cannot use area median income because that basically keeps a well-to-do community well-to-do. We must use a seconds. Point. Thank you so much, candidates. We have two final things before we wrap up. We're gonna wrap up very close to the promised 7.30 hour. One is I just wanna let all of the candidates and all of the audience members, all of whom I thank for their participation know, we're gonna follow this up with questionnaires to all of the candidates. So I hope you will um, respond to them and fill them out. So in addition to being able to share this video with the public, we're gonna give you a little more time to think about and, and give some uh, you know, sort of longer responses on some of these issues. And we will um, share that with the public as well um, in advance of the uh, June primaries. And then lastly, every candidate, we're gonna give you a maximum of 60 seconds for a final closing statement. And as promised, we're gonna do it in reverse alphabetical order since we started in alphabetical order. So we are going to start with Arthur Schwartz. This time I unmuted myself. Uh, I, I think that I have shown throughout this discussion that I am the candidate who is most connected to uh, preservation in this among this group of candidates. I am a candidate who has done what he has done in order to fight for my neighbors as a volunteer for the last 40 years that I've lived in this community. Uh, I am somebody who is dedicated to fighting against and not working with and not relying on the real estate industry in order to, whether it's to develop affordable housing or somehow protect preser preservation. Uh, I, am the, I am the candidate who has spent 42 years in the trenches as a public interest lawyer fighting for the for communities, fighting for poor people, fighting for men, fighting for women, fighting for workers, fighting for people at night. New York City Housing Authority saw the complaints about, uh, and I will continue to fight for this community as I have, including on the very controversial 14th Street busway litigation, which somehow nobody brought up today, uh, which was rooted in preserving our community, preserving, uh, keeping traffic off the streets in our community in a way that was gonna be destructive to the community. You know, I, I appreciate the support I've gotten so far from my neighbors. I hope that I will get your support on June 22nd. And thank you very much, Andrew, for hosting this forum. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Lesby, uh, Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and thank you for having us tonight. I am running as a mother, a wife, a daughter to small business owners, granddaughter of immigrants, a reporter, an organizer, and a long-term resident. I want to be your representative and I want to be your champion and fighter as we switch to recovery mode because that is what we are going to need in our representative in the next few years. It's a little bit of a different role, a city council person, than it's been in the past. Uh, I am solutions oriented and in those solutions, I value balance. I value pragmatism and not just solutions for now, but long term because I believe that's how we create and maintain strong and balanced neighborhoods. I've been saying um, this whole time that I am a resident to represent residents. And that's not because of my geographic location, but because I believe resident voices and community participation is paramount to any programs and policies impacting our neighborhoods. Listen, COVID-19 really exposed to me a, a leadership gap in our district. And the road of COVID recovery will be tough, but this is also a remarkable opportunity allowing us to press the restart button. And I promise I will get things done. And um, I know all of you might know this, but it's ranked choice voting this year. So if you do decide to go with someone else for number one, I would love to be your number two. And I don't think I've said that often actually, but I, I wouldn't mind it in this case. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next we have Alita Lafarge. 
thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about this because this community is my home. And this is a time that's calling not to the usual people, not to the usual policies, not to the usual incremental compromises. It's time for straightforward conversations, for creative, compassionate thinking that cuts through the way things have always been to make real change that works for all of us. I mean, it was really never my dream to do this, to run for office, but I'm doing it to get it done, to make a difference for my community, for my city, for my son. And I promise that if you make me your first choice on June 22nd, I will do the work to make real change for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Marnie Halasa. Okay. Um, like I said before, there is a revolution brewing. Like the movie network, people are not going to take it anymore. And I, I see this all the time. Um, the, the rallies that I go to, uh, just talking to neighbors, on you know, people on the street, my neighbors, uh, that we're all sort of like joining together in solidarity to sort of fight to save our city. For years, we've had policies of neoliberalism, austerity, gentrification that have hurt our district and its residents. You see the ramifications of this every time you walk down the street. Um, the pandemic only exacerbated what we already knew, that our city is being tailored for the wealthy with no regard to the middle and low income classes, with a disproportionate uh, amount being pe uh, on people of color. But there is somebody to blame, uh, and that's our council member, Corey Johnson, and his staff that never came out against his policies and our mayor. So relief is within reach, but they never give it to us. And that's, a, and that's a huge problem. And so when you go to the ballot box on June 22nd, I hope you support me. I'm a regular person, an ordinary person, and I'm going to fight for regular New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Thanks. I, I think when you feel that, you know, the representatives you've elected um, don't really understand you or, or don't share your values that are making decisions that are really affecting your life, then really not only is it your time to get involved, but it's your responsibility. Um, I don't think I'm an extraordinary person, but throughout my life, I have dealt with uh, extraordinary adversity. You know, I, I moved to New York because um, gun violence changed my life forever. You know, my father was murdered. And um, I think I've worked really hard to, um, to build my businesses and, and to raise my daughter. Um, and that's just really what I'm trying to do now, like thousands of other New Yorkers. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, Everyday people need to get involved in the everyday decisions that affect their lives. And that's really what I'm doing. Um, if you elect me or you put me as your first, uh, you know, community comes first. Um, our kids come first. Um, our families, our small businesses. And I think that I'll be the kind of person that will bridge those two and uh, make decisions with equity always in mind. Thank you so much for. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and finally, we have Eric Botcher. This has been one of the most difficult years in the history of New York. We're seeing a level of pain that I don't think any of us ever anticipated seeing. But I really believe that if we come together with the right leadership, that we could have one of the best decades ahead of us in the history of New York City. I really believe that our best days could be ahead of us, but only if we come together. And that's what my campaign for city council is about. That's what the movement that we're building here in the district is about. We have the support of hundreds of community leaders, block association presidents, tenant association presidents, tenants pack, uh, noted preservationists. Anthony Wood wrote the book on preservation. We're not taking any donations from real estate developers, corporate PACs, lobbyists. In seconds. We are united and a determination to see our city succeed in the face of unprecedented difficulties. And I know we will, with your support, go to ericbotcher.com, read about my, my plans, my proposals, sign up. And I really believe that we could turn our city around and bring New York City back. Thank you to all the candidates so much and to the participants. Um, as everyone knows, Village Preservation is a 501c3, so we won't be telling you who to vote for, but we will be trying to give you as much information about the candidates as possible and encouraging you to make smart decisions. 
Our city council member has a huge impact on our neighborhoods and our city and our future. So educate yourself and make sure you get out there and vote. Thank you very much, everybody.